Hello there. I am Dr. Wendy Benson, an IO psychologist and assistant professor of psychology at Marshall University, and I'm really excited to share the magic of collaborative learning with you and possibly inspire you to try it in your own classes. So collaborative learning goes beyond the sage on the stage model, where students listen to instructors lecture, read the textbook, and take exams in isolation, to a model that involves active learning, critical thinking, teamwork, and developing collaboration skills. You've probably noticed that students tend to dread group projects and are hesitant to speak up in class, but this quick video will give you some reasons why having students work together is worth the effort and how to facilitate engaging, rewarding, and mastery-focused collaborative learning in your classes. So I'm going to dig into the benefits and best practices of collaborative testing and collaborative problem-based learning and then give you some really practically applicable strategies for how to implement in this in your classes to maximize group success. So collaborative testing allows students to work together on an exam, discussing answer options and coming up to a consensus on the best response. So students build communication and collaboration skills while solidifying their understanding of course concepts and really building confidence in their ability to discuss complex ideas and issues. So students report decreased anxiety with the addition of collaborative testing, with students who report the highest levels of test anxiety benefiting the most from those collaborative approaches. Students have also I have increased motivation to study when you use collaborative testing because they have a desire to perform well in front of their peers. Just like research shows that when you do peer reviews, it increases effort. Same with collaborative testing with peers. Collaborative testing also benefits knowledge retrieval because you have repeated knowledge retrieval, which makes learned information more accessible for future use and really has both short and long term benefits. Collaborative testing enhances student learning both through discussion and a process known as testing effect. So testing effect causes information to become part of the student's knowledge structure through retrieval rather than traditional studying that just uses encoding. And this is true whether test questions are the same for both the individual and collaborative tests or if they have different versions for the individual versus the collaborative test. Repeated collaborative testing has shown greater learning benefits than just repeated individual testing as well. So some best practices for how to implement collaborative testing in your classes. So it's really important to encourage students to actively participate and come to a consensus before answering so that you don't end up having somebody who's really quiet in the group or somebody who just dominates and answers all the questions for them. I encourage you to actually put collaboration instructions on the exam itself that they're taking as a group and then actually monitor it in class and kind of jump into the groups where you can tell that they're not coming to a consensus and some people are particularly quiet or particularly active. Research also suggests that it's best to randomly assign students to groups for, cognitive or, um, for collaborative testing because collaborative groups could maybe divide and conquer in advance and not actually come together to work. So usually collaborative groups consist of three to seven students and you have students self, if you have students self-select into groups, which is a common approach, then there's problems because that will, again, have them maybe say, okay, you study this section, I'll study this section. So it's actually better to have random assignment to prevent students from knowing who their group composition is in advance so that they can't do that dividing material among themselves for study. So you kind of are reducing the tendency for cognitive loafing by doing random assignment. They don't know who they're going to be paired with. It's also important that there's at least two days between group and individual tests to capitalize on that testing effect that I mentioned earlier. And my quasi-experimental research with statistics students shows that compared to students who took their four tests in the class solo before taking it collaboratively, students who got to collaborate with their group on their test before taking it solo gave higher course evaluation ratings, reported less stress and anxiety about the class, felt that collaborative testing was more useful when they got to take it as a group first, and students who got to collaborate with a group on their test before taking it solo also had higher solo test grades and final grades than students who didn't have collaborative testing at all or the section of statistics students who completed the solo tests before the collaborative tests. 
It's important to mention too that in my study, there was no significant difference in mean solo test grades or final grades between the sections of my stats class who did solo first testing or no collaborative testing at all. So it really looks like that group first testing gives you the, give you the biggest bang for your buck there. Now let's switch to collaborative problem-based learning. So collaborative problem-based learning is a student-centered pedagogy that emphasizes active learning through solving real-world problems with peers or instructors. PBL shifts away from traditional direct teaching methods where a teacher imparts facts and concepts to students. Instead, PBL involves groups of students working collaboratively to solve open-ended problems. The goal is not just to find a predefined solution, but to develop critical thinking, problem-solving skills, and teamwork abilities that are essential for lifelong learning. So some benefits of PBL are that students get to experience the value of peer-to-peer -peer learning that's enhanced through problem solving and communication. It allows students to gain confidence and sharpen their individual abilities while collaborating with their peer peers. Research also suggests that students who get to do problem-based learning versus just kind of the, the lecture model have more satisfaction with the learning experience, are also more motivated, have more academic achievement, have more interest in the concepts that they're learning, and do develop those really important critical thinking skills. If you think about it, we live in an age where we can go on the internet and find the answer to just about any question we have but we can't go on the internet and learn how to collaborate and work with people. So giving our students that skill is really valuable. So some best practices for collaborative PBL. So arranging some activities to encourage students to know each other's motivation and areas of competence or expertise before working together really facilitates their expertise for collaborative learning. It increases their engagement and it improves the discussion atmosphere, which helps increase the efficiency of group work. If team members have different backgrounds, the division of roles will be more efficient in collaborative learning. So it's important to make sure that you have a variety of roles in the groups that people are comfortable filling. And if team members uh, cooperate with each other by respecting their expertise, the teamwork efficiency can be drastically improved. You just have to make sure that everyone is involved with the decision making, even if they have different roles or areas of expertise. Student selected groups seem to benefit from high cooperation when they get to choose who they work with. They also have more easy communication and positive attitudes towards their group outcome. But research suggests that when students get to self-select their groups, they tend to falter when it comes to task-orientedness, which is considered as one of the most significant aspects of group's dynamics that really directly influences the group work outcome. Research also suggests that teacher-assigned groups tend to exhibit more commitment to the academic task assigned for group work and are thus more successful at accomplishing it. I've actually found that kind of a hybrid model works well. I found that having students work with the instructor to determine which factors should be used to determine group assignment is the best of both worlds. It's also best to have the same groups of students work together on small assignments early on in the semester that help them build the rapport, the knowledge, and the collaboration skills to complete more complex projects later on. Really, I think the first assignment should be kind of an onboarding activity that I'll show you in a little bit, where you develop a collaboration and communication plan and how you're going to share information online, and also develop a rubric for how you'll evalu evaluate each other's level of collaboration and contribution at the end of the semester. And I'll show an example of this here soon. So now let's look at some ideas and best practices for strategic group management. Instead of just randomly assigning people to groups and hoping it all works out, which is maybe a best practice for testing, it's really nice if you're doing a major group project to be strategic about who you assign to groups and how you get them all on board. So I usually create a survey with students at the beginning of the semester that I use to assign students to groups. So I usually have students help me create a Qualtrics survey in one class then complete the survey before the next class. Then we use the data with the names hidden in the next class to determine the best teams. I take notes on why groups were assigned together, as I'll show you in a little bit. So like, for example, everybody in this group's available on Monday afternoons and is hoping to get a PhD. So here are some ideas for what you can put on a strategic team or group assignment survey. So I think availability is really important. Students usually think that is too, especially if you're not going to give them time in class to work together, which I highly recommend as well. 
So you can just put when are you available and have, you know, Monday afternoons, mornings, evenings, and do it for every day of the week. I throw weekends on there too because some students prefer to week work together outside of class on weekends. I also ask what role they typically fill in work groups. And I'll tell you, people will admit to being a slacker, believe it or not. But that just helps me make sure that I don't have a bunch of leaders or a bunch of slackers in one group. It's always good to have a variety of comfort levels with roles in each group. So you kind of want a group based on similar availability, but a variety of roles. I also like to ask what their class standing is just to kind of gauge their experience. And I tend to try to put people with different class standings together so they can help each other out. The class that I, I usually teach psychology classes, so I also, um, if we're doing a research project, which I usually do in my classes, I ask them what field they're interested in, and I try to group them based on having similar fields of interest, so they'll have an easier time figuring out what they want to focus on, they may bond and make friends with people who are interested in similar things, and maybe even help each other kind of plan their future career directions. I also like to ask students how old they are and group them based on having a variety of ages. I think that type of diversity brings a really unique and creative perspective. I also like to ask students what their plans are after graduation. So in addition to what are your interests, well, what are your plans? And similar to having similar interests in the groups, I like to have similar plans after graduation in the groups. Because if you have a whole group of people who are trying to get a PsyD, well, maybe they can actually become a support group for each other beyond the scope of the class and help each other reach their goals. I also like to ask students how comfortable they are performing the variety of tasks that are going to be required for the major assignment at the end of the semester or whatever project they're working on. So you can see here we were doing a research project, so I asked them their comfort level with various things that were going to be required for them. And I like to use these questions to make sure there's a diverse level of skill sets and comfort levels in each group so they can kind of harness each other's strengths and make up for their weaknesses and learn from each other as well. You don't want to put a bunch of people who are not comfortable at all reading journal articles in a group, right? You want to make sure there's at least one person in there that kind of bring people up to speed and be a confidence booster. So in summary, when you're doing the matchmaking, and I've seen this happen and it works so well, I've seen groups of students become best friends in my class and, and connect with each other after the class is over and hang out after class and get on group texts and support each other and it's a beautiful thing. So make sure that you have similar schedules, interests, and goals, diverse roles, ages, comfort level with required skills, and experience or class standing. So here's an example of what the matchmaking can look like. Um, so I bring up all the data in class after they've taken the survey, and then I highlight people who we think should be in groups together in the, the same color, and we kind of go through it together, and I hide everybody's names while we do this, and I don't reveal the names until the end. I also allow students to request if they want to work with a particular student in the class or if they don't want to work with a particular student in the class. And I always honor those. If students have friends, I will group them together if they request it. So you can see here, after we go through and we do the activity, I hid the names here, but I would have all the names listed and then have why I grouped them together listed. And I provide that to them so they can really easily go back and kind of have a framework of what to discuss when they get together for the first time and when they're available to work together. So I also like the first time that after, right after I get the groups assigned, we do onboarding. So let me show you what that looks like. So I have this assignment available and they go through and I kind of give them buy-in for why group work is important because a lot of students are resistant to it. We have a checklist where they introduce themselves, share any concerns they have, share their perceived competence. This is for a different class, so this is kind of the skills we're doing here decide when they're available, decide on when they're, where they're going to meet, the best mode of communication, sharing contact information, and then completing the next page, which has them really spell out what are they going to do if there's a group member who's not contributing? What are they going to do if there's a dominating group member? What's the time we're going to commit to meeting if we need to every week? How are you going to meet? What are you going to do if somebody can't attend a meeting? How are you going to keep your documents and your notes and your files? How are you going to communicate? All those things then I think it's really important that part of their grade is how their group evaluated them. And they come up with the group rubric of how to evaluate each other at the end of the semester. I also like having the group come up with their own team name and encouraging them to be silly and fun and creative. And then I refer to them by their name throughout the semester. And it just kind of brings a little bit of levity and silliness to the class, especially if they really run with the uh, creative names. I also encourage you to use online tools because collaborative learning doesn't just have to happen in in-person classes. You can use Blackboard groups to uh, make grading 
this group work really, really easy. Everybody in the group gets the same grade. Everybody gets the feedback you provide. Only one group member has to submit the assignments. Blackboard groups allow you to do it randomly. You can assign custom, like for problem-based learning when I do strategic group assignment, or you can allow students to simply self-select. I also like to use Microsoft Teams to do synchronous breakout rooms. I ran a collaborative learning lab over the summer and we used Microsoft Teams exclusively. So we would get together as a whole group and then I would put them in their breakout rooms and they would work together. Black or Microsoft Teams also has a really great, great whiteboard feature that makes it really easy to share notes and collaborate. And with Microsoft Teams, you can have random breakout rooms or manually assign them. I also like to use OneNote in Blackboard. If you activate it, everybody has access to the same OneNote, but they also have private OneNotes. And you can create group pages within OneNote where they can share files and asynchronously um, collaborate on like shared documents. All right, well, I hope that you feel inspired to try this in your own class. And if you ever want to reach out to me, uh, my email is bensonw at marshall.edu. And I would love to chat about this stuff with you all. Here's my references so you know I'm legit. <laughs> And thank you so much.